Hi guys, welcome to another Kicking It with Karan episode. Today we have a very special guest, one of our customers, uh, Stefan from Phoenix. Uh, thanks again for taking the time. Uh, you know, you uh, uh, for for my audience anyway. Why don't you uh, give a little intro about yourself? Where you come from? What do you do? Uh, what does Phoenix uh, uh, Real Time Solutions does as well? Uh, and uh, let's go from there. So we provide uh, solutions for real time broadcasting, glass to glass, less than half a second across the globe. Um, we typically handle from on site. It could be a Phoenix encoder or web browser. Uh, all the way uh, to delivering to the end user. Um, I started the company uh, in 2013 because I realized that there will be a need for low latency distribution. I had the vision that uh, one day we're going to stream the opening, opening ceremony to a billion people uh, in real time uh, using multi-camera angles and a truly personalized experience for every viewer. Uh, while they can, like we do today, uh, you know, interact online and uh, be in sync with each other. Interesting, interesting. So, how's uh, how sort of COVID affected the business from that perspective? I mean, video streaming is going through the roof. Yeah, I think you know, I think the um, pandemic obviously impacted every, every business, uh, put a lot of stress and uh, uh, uncertainty on on execution. Uh, it's certainly the case that you know several um, uh, of the content that was related to uh, sports uh, you know, was, was shut down, right? So uh, we had several lounges that got delayed uh, by about a month or two because they had shut down everything. Um, but um, the silver lining of it, I think the momentum to adopt real time uh, because it provides a true platform for engagement has grown dramatically. So there's a lot more appetite uh, in this market now to uh, build a, a truly um, interactive experience and real-time video is a, is a critical part for that. I bet, I bet. So, um, you know, you started in 2013, about seven years ago, I think, uh, you know, at the time, obviously OCI didn't even exist, right? So that was before we were born, uh, so to speak. Uh, you know, AWS and I think Microsoft were the incumbents that, at the time. So, Am I am I am I right in guessing you were sort of born into the cloud, so to speak, or did you start on prem and then kind of journeyed into the cloud? Like, what was your kind of? I mean, uh, yeah, you can call us a cloud baby in a sense. Uh, we were cloud first, cloud only. Never had the intent to even own a server, right? So that was that was from the day zero. Um, it was designed for the cloud. Um, I think it takes advantage of the elasticity. Uh, like we don't, you know, we we can. Um, scale based on, on cloud resources, right? And our platform is built with, with that in mind from the, the ground. It's kind of like a multi-cloud world. And you know, they're trying to make sure that their platform is, is flexible enough that they can sort of, you know, sort of shepherd uh, across multiple cloud providers, whether it's for capacity purposes or DR or high availability even for that matter. So how do you kind of think about that when you're building your platform and, uh, you know, as you, as you use OCI? Yeah, it's definitely a, a multi-cloud um, world out there, right? I think it's required from, from a perspective of um, high ability, you know, being able to sustain outages of services. Uh, for all the mission critical uh, elements, we designed it, um, I think, probably similar than to actually what OCI's data structure, that the data center architecture looks like, right? Where you want to make sure that, it, you know, there's no failure that propagates from one to the other. Uh, needlessly, right? And that uh, potentially having a, a rollout plan even for like changes, right? So that you don't put the whole, uh, um, you know, all, all the data centers at risk at the same time mm -hmm. uh, so that you have like uh, failure barriers, if you will. So um, this can then applies across cloud providers as well. Um, in terms of technology, right? I think I, I'm, I'm a kind of bare cloud API kind of guy, right? So I prefer to keep it as simple as possible uh, after you know our you know experience in seven years it's like apis and sdks there is they maybe make it an sdk may make it fast to integrate it but then you have maintenance nightmares where you know apis are going to be deprecated you don't even know which part of that sdk is calling what underneath the cover and <laughs> you get a notification that api so and so is sunset in july and you don't know what 
it belongs to. <laughs> Dependency management is probably a nightmare that I'm guessing, yeah. right? Um, I mean, in general, it's a nightmare category, but I think our approach is uh, Docker first, right? So uh, we, we operate our platform as one Docker image. And uh, and therefore, if once, once an image is built, everything is set in stone. So we don't have this um, zero day uh, NPM registry issues because our, 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 our servers already have everything baked in. So there's no download, nothing anymore once it's shipped. Awesome. Okay, so you're containerized, which means that it's easy to, to move across cloud pl platforms for that matter, or even, even on-prem if you ever decided to go back that route. <laughs> but um, uh, why, uh, you know, why Oracle? I think, I think I always like to ask this question to our customers. Well, as you mentioned earlier, right, when we started, OCI was not even born yet. Um, so it has a, maybe a similar aspect to our history is that, well, we started with a clean slate and we, we saw the need and, and we built from the ground up for that in mind, right? So that allowed us to cut some of the slack that, um, you know, often happens and in the cloud certainly happened with kind of legacy technology that's built up on older uh, uh, architecture and, and repurposed, right? And so I think the OCI had that advantage that they, uh, with the OCI cloud, came in and, and, and built it from scratch. Um, and it aligned well, right? Because I mentioned before, I'm a very bare bone API person, right? Mm -hmm. I, I like to see service, uh, like instances basically as a service and bandwidth as a service, right? And then we built the, the core mission critical building blocks based on that. So I didn't need a lot of, uh, you know, like UI and other stuff. So th this, this was there very early. Uh, was a very appealing. I think Oracle also understands uh, enterprise, right? So it's like, um, um, you know, because we are, in a sense, a reseller uh, of, mm -hmm. of, of that's part of our uh, technology that we ship. You know, the so, some of the kind of cloud pricing points just don't make sense for this kind of relationship, right? And and Oracle, uh, I think, has that enterprise feel that made it easy uh, and cost effective for us to to adapt the solution. Interesting. Cool. Cool. So uh, one one point I did want to hit on was uh, I, I noticed also that that you started uh, uh, using some of our new flexible shapes, right? So how's your experience been on our AMD shapes uh, for flexible instances? Yeah, I uh, absolutely love the AMDs. I mean, they're the, in, in, you know, we run our own benchmarks for our workloads. Uh, we have different benchmarks for different things, but the, the picture is uh, across the board. It's, it's a great, uh, performs at the top of the line, exceeding uh, or, or beating other chipsets in the market. And also uh, in terms of bang for the buck, uh, it's it's a clearly a market leader. And for us, it's kind of the first choice now. Got it, got it. All right, so maybe maybe a last question from my perspective then, as, as we you know take feedback and look into our roadmap, what's something you wanna see in the future? I mean, you've already got a pretty good, ex, you know, sort of experience with OCI, you've been using flexible instances. What do you want to see in the next couple of months or next couple of years from us, right? Yeah, uh, I mean, on the, the, the short term, I think um, it's already on, on your roadmap. It's instance groups that allow us to uh, manage the life cycle of each individual member um, instance in that group. Um, and then in the you know the long term, I think, you know, keep uh, expanding and the points of presence. I think it's, it matters uh, as we keep penetrating markets and get more volume, right? I think, uh, you know, the cloud footprint is obviously kind of a close reflection of population density. Uh, but when we have, you know, a few dozens to a uh, few more dozens, it, it just uh, gets us the ability to reach more people, a higher percentage um, with much, much lower latency. And I think it matters for us, it matters for other market segments as well, because uh, latency is certainly something that enables a lot of new business right now, right? Being it in the gaming industry or for engagement uh, in, in, in general. Awesome, awesome, cool. Well, uh, you know, this was a small snippet and a, and a brief conversation, but uh, thanks again for, you know, taking the time, uh, Stefan. I, I really enjoyed the conversation and hopefully maybe we do another one of these where we actually get into the nitty gritty of this stuff and, uh, you know, we can, uh, we can talk more about it. Yeah, sure. Thanks Great. for having me. All right. Thank you. And then thanks everybody else for joining us for another episode. We'll catch you next time. Ciao.